invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, our text this week is verses 13 to 23. So if you're able, please stand with me and honor the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 says, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for just the details that are involved in this. We thank you for the fact that your, your faithfulness extends to the point that your, your prophecies are fulfilled. We thank you for the hundreds of, of prophecies that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus and in his ministry and in his death and his burial and his resurrection. And so we ask now, Father, as we go through this passage, we pray, Lord, that you will show us exactly what you want us to see through it and that you will... Allow, it, allow us to apply it to our lives so that we can be more like Jesus. And we pray this in His name, for His sake. Amen. Please be seated. Matthew's narrative is continuing here in the second half of chapter 2. When we stopped last week, the Magi had been warned not to meet with Herod again. And so they sought safety through an alternative route, alternate route. <clears throat> this particular Herod... There's a lot that's known about him. This particular Herod killed three of his own sons. Because he was, he was convinced that they were trying to take his role prematurely. So it didn't even matter if, if they were a threat to him or not. He was convinced himself that they were, and so he had them done away with. This is the kind of a mindset that we're talking about here. But he was afraid of losing this powerful position, and he was afraid of, of that he would have to take some extreme measures here to protect that status quo, because it was a good gig that he had, and he was, he was not going to give it up for, for anybody. Now, you may think, as you read through this, you may think that this Herod was just mean, or that this Herod was crazy, and in either way, you'd be right, because he was both. He chose to copy the strategy that, that Pharaoh had used to kill Moses or to attempt to kill Moses some 1,500 years earlier. The strategy is familiar to you. Just kill every male child under two years of age. Scripture spares us, thankfully, the details of the tragedy that hit so many homes in that day. While this particular tyrant is trying to eliminate any future opponents. The horrific scene from ancient Israel is now being repeated as Herod tries to eliminate the child who fulfills so many of the scriptures that were sacred to the Jewish people. However, God 
just like he did with Moses, prevented these lunatic governing despots from murdering by speaking to people in dreams. The young couple probably, even at this point, only had a partial understanding of the importance of their child. When God sends another dream, they respond. However, we have to realize that having these magi from distant countries in the east, and it had to provide both clarity and joy for them. And yet as we see that, this particular cause for rejoicing is immediately replaced by a sense of urgency. And what jumps out at us as we read this is that it is humanly impossible for even the craziest government official to interrupt God's plans. And we see this in the last hours before the crucifixion, and we'll see it here as well. Uh, through this map up here, just to kind of let you just give you an idea of what's going on. So the, the flight to Egypt for the child, you can see kind of up there's Nazareth up there at the top. There's Samaria, it goes down to Jerusalem, and so this is the flight to Egypt down here at the bottom. And they don't just, you know, and I'll get to this in a minute, they don't just cross the border to get out of the way of Herod, but they go about 100 miles inland to, or, or further into the country. So we're going to see how the family fled for Egypt in verses 13 and 14. It says, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. Now, I called this to your attention last week. We'll see it uh, here. There's two clear examples referring to Jesus and Mary as the child and his mother, which I think is a, a little bit of, a, of, a, of the, the appropriate response to it, obviously, because it's the way the, the biblical writers do it. But uh, on top of that, it, it, I think it, it clearly distinguishes the fact that they are not equal parts. They are not co-redeemers or, or anything like that that comes up later on in history. But you'll remember that this is not the first dream. The, the first dream that, that came along was that, that Mary was carrying the Messiah. This particular dream alerts him to, the, to Herod's plan, and it convinces him to immediately move the family. There's, where it says, get up here, that's the way you and I would say that. Uh, in, the, in the Greek, there's, there's definitely a sense of urgency in that word. But Herod doesn't wait for the Magi to report to him, <laughs> as he had requested but Herod would quickly realize that he'd been fooled and the Magi were not returning. It didn't, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a shrewd character. It didn't take much for him to figure it out. So you have, to, you have to now throw in the sense of anger. So not only have you got the ruler who is crazy, now he's mad. He's mad and, and the, mad and crazy at the same time. But it's actually about a 75-mile trip, as we looked at the map a minute ago, if you go from Bethlehem down to the border of Egypt. And it says here they started in the dark. And they likely go about another 100 miles into the heart of the country. And just think about that for a second. You're on foot, and you're carrying a small child. 175 miles. That's a trip. I mean, that had to take weeks. But scripture doesn't tell us how long it took, but it had to take a, quite a long time. But I also want you to note there's an interesting Greek word in here. That the word that's translated here, flee, F-L-E-E, -E, is, is exactly where we get our word fugitive. It's in the present tense, which means it's a continuous action that's involved. So 175 miles on foot with a child is, is, a, is a long trip, and... There's a sense of urgency about it, though. The angel tells Joseph to expect another dream with further instructions, but they need to stay put until that dream comes. So you can locate these passages in both 1st and 2nd Kings that Egypt was often used by the Jews as a place of refuge during political upheaval. The Jews had resettled extensively in Egypt. In fact, 
Alexandria became a center of higher education and the library system that was there is surpassed only by the one that is in Athens. Those of you who are in the come to the pastor's class, you remember we talked about that when we were in Acts 17. We talked about the philosophers and who were uh, uh, in Greece and, and the fact that this was kind of like the center of, of higher education. But you might also probably imagine that Alexandria was named after Alexander the Great who had established a sanctuary for Jews there. And by the way, in a very small window of history between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a period of time when the Greeks ruled over Israel. <clears throat> by the first century, what we pick up in the New Testament, Rome rules that particular area. But the powers in the Old Testament are Babylon and Medo-Persia. And then this little gap in the middle that we don't have any biblical record of is Greek. The Greeks ruled over that. There was a period of time that started <clears throat> with a revolution of this family, this Jewish family called, uh, their name was uh, Maccabees. And it was from the time of the Maccabean Revolution in that period of these dark years between the, the intertestament, easy for you to say, intertestamental times between the writings of the two testaments, then many Jews sought safety in Egypt. And even in decades that followed, when the Romans come and they conquered, Alexandria was still considered a safe haven for the Jews. So it's similar to what's happening across the world today as Muslims relocate in various countries across the world. You can go back through <clears throat> Jeremiah chapters 43 and 44, and you can find that the relocation of Jews was so intense that there were likely almost a million Jews in Egypt by this time. And there are two important facts here that we'll look at quickly. First, in those days, Egypt was also a Roman province. But Herod had no jurisdiction there. So as soon as they got to the border, they were safe, but they needed, because they were traveling with a child, they needed some other things, so they, had to, they went on in further. But then secondly, this trip fulfills the prophecy of Hosea. So let's, let's look in verse 15, and we'll see Hosea fulfilled. <clears throat> verse 15 says, He remained there until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now Matthew gives us some information here that will detail a few verses later regarding Herod's death. So he was told to stay there until Herod died. And Matthew is going to quote Hosea 11.1 1 here. You, your, your Bible probably has that in a footnote. It's some 700 years earlier. Once again, God's foreknowledge means that he is not surprised and Herod's strategy is certainly not in the panic mode that most of us would be. You can't catch God by surprise because he sees ahead of us. And Hosea is writing this, when you see this, my son here, it refers to Israel. It's a historical statement about what God had already done to bring his people out of bondage to Egypt with Moses. So do the math kind of quickly here. An event that happened 700 years before Hosea and referred to by Hosea is now used as a messianic prophecy 700 years even later. Hosea wrote about God's love for Israel and his promise of a deliverer who would then who would draw them to himself. Matthew saw Hosea's prophecy from the perspective of Jesus as that deliverer. Not only for the Jews, but for the entire world. The Joseph is discussed in the latter chapters of Genesis, not this one here. The other Joseph had been taken captive in Egypt when he was sold into slavery by his brothers. You remember that? But then Joseph is safe and he flourishes in Egypt. Now, some of the fuzziness is going to get a little clearer here. Herod emulates Pharaoh, and Jesus is that deliverer, much like Moses, and all of this is done by God and not through some really smart people. The 
miracles of the Exodus foreshadow Jesus' return from Egypt to Israel. In Jesus, the restoration of Israel from exile is complete. Let's look in verses, verse 16. We'll see Herod's furious response. Verse 16 says, Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its vicinity from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Now, since Bethlehem is five miles from Jerusalem, Herod probably expected a pretty quick response from the Magi. Never came. <coughs> And it likely didn't, didn't take Herod, who was a con, very long to realize that he had been conned by the Magi. And when the dreams occur, the Magi go one way, the family go another way, family goes another way, and then they're all ahead of Herod, uh, Herod's plot to find and to kill the Messiah. And the Greek word, Greek word here for tricked, carries a sense of mockery, and the King James Version actually uses that word there, mock. Now, it's used to describe the accusations and the taunts that Jesus' the enemy used against him in the Passion Week. You remember that. They mocked him. They insulted him. Herod probably felt tricked rather than mocked because everyone was fleeing him for safety. And he had no... no first off, he didn't even believe in God, so he certainly didn't believe that God, who in his mind didn't exist, was involved in this kind of sending people in different directions away from him. I mean, he thinks he's just been disobeyed, which was probably something he wasn't, wasn't really good at dealing with anyway. But the phrase there, very enraged, is a strong Greek word that does have an, have an adverb in front of it. It could very easily be translated very. But it probably should be even stronger, such as uncontrollably. So this is an anger that is uncontrolled. He's beside himself. It appears in the passive voice here, which, which indicates that Herod had totally lost control of this passion and was now being controlled by it. I mean, you, you know this. Passion can become anger in a blink. And Herod is way past anger. So his plan is thus it's executed much to complete and utter heartbreak of many young Jewish parents. Ironically, Jesus didn't want Herod's throne. So there was no need for Herod's paranoia. Like many people, he completely misunderstood the Messiah would save people from their sins rather than save people from the Roman rule. Jesus didn't want Herod's job. He wanted Herod's heart. Jesus didn't want to kill Herod. He wanted to save him. We share the gospel with family and friends, and most people simply have an area in their lives that they don't want to give up. Jesus doesn't want to take things from us. He wants to provide us things like peace and joy. Herod has no need to fear Jesus, and neither do friends and family. People we share the gospel with, they have no need to fear Jesus. They should welcome Him. They need to allow Jesus to reign as the Lord of their lives, just like Herod needed to. There's no reason to fear Him like Herod did. Now let's look at verses 17 and 18. We'll see Jeremiah fulfilled. Jeremiah fulfilled. 17 says, Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children as she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Now if you don't have this footnote in your Bible, this verse comes from Jeremiah 31.15. Rachel was one of the wives of Jacob back again in the Genesis account. His 12 sons become the leaders of the tribes of Israel, so Rachel became the symbolic mother of the nation. Now, I mentioned this last week. She was buried near Bethlehem. The Jeremiah passage pictures Rachel weeping for her children 
who had been taken away into captivity. Rama was a staging point of deportation. The mothers of Bethlehem wept and mourned for their little boys killed at the hands of Herod's soldiers. This would be impossible to comfort. Matthew compares the, the pure sorrow of mothers of the time, of the exile, to the anguish of the mothers, of the slaughtered boys. G. Campbell Morgan, the great British evangelist and author of the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, wrote this. It is a terrible and awful story, that of Jeremiah's prophesying, prophesying and suffering and tears. But in Jeremiah, as in every other prophecy, there was a gleam of hope. How great were these Hebrew prophets, so cloudy, so rough, so stormy, but on every storm cloud there is a rainbow, a promise of deliverance. This is only one of the four the only one of the four gospels that refers to this incident, and it fits Matthew's theme of fulfilled prophecy at the birth of Christ to establish that he was the king. Jesus was the king. This is, this is very important as we go through Matthew. Jeremiah 31, 15 doesn't look on the outside like it's a prophecy, but it's a prophecy not because it's inherent in the text, it's a prophecy because Matthew said it was a prophecy. Amen? Amen. The prophesying of Jeremiah was maybe the most tragic prophesying of all in Israel's history because he uttered the doom of a dying nation. His was kind of like a funeral dirge and he uttered it with tears. Do that nobody would listen and nobody would repent of the captivity. Jesus said in Luke 13, 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who sent to her, those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. Jeremiah wept over Jerusalem. And so did Jesus. Even in Jeremiah's prophecy, there's great hope, believe it or not. From Jeremiah chapter 30 to Jeremiah chapter 33, we have four chapters that are filled with hope and joy and comfort. Jeremiah is talking about doom and the Babylonian captivity came not long after it took them all away and it was a terrible tragedy. This statement about weeping and lamentation and the children and all that is right in the middle of the hope, right in the middle of the comfort, and right in the middle of this section of joy. And even though there's weeping and lamentation, there's tears, these chapters look ahead to the coming Messiah. These chapters look ahead to the one who's going to come and make things right. The very next verse in the prophecy, Jeremiah 31, 16, Thus says the Lord, Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. And they will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children will return to their own territory. Some 70 years later, God redeems his people. The same thing is true in the use of the prophecy by Matthew. There was Rachel weeping for her children. There was lamentation because of the destruction that came on the nation that rejected its Messiah. But at the same time, there was hope. Because even then, there was a remnant. And one day, according to Romans chapter 11, y'all know this, God is going to regather that whole nation. Now let's look in verses 19 through 21. We'll see that the family fled for Israel. Family fled for Israel. 19 says, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who saw the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Notice there's two more references. It doesn't say Mary and Jesus. It says the child and his mother. One of the church fathers, Josephus, who was the Jewish historian for the Romans, wrote in his Antiquities 
tells us that Herod died of, get this, right before lunch. Mm -hmm. Ulcerated entrails, putrefied and maggot-filled organs, constant convulsions, foul breath, and neither physicians nor warm baths led to recovery. It seems appropriate that someone that wicked would die a slow, painful, horrible death. And remember, the angel told Joseph to wait until Herod died back in verse 13, so now he was dead. The angel came and, and said the next place in fulfilling the, pro, the prophetic word is Nazareth. But apparently Herod wasn't the only one trying to kill the baby. There were some others involved, and the Lord had set them aside also. And we don't have any word about that, but it's, uh, this word is definitely plural. Describes that they are all dead. All of Herod, Herod and all of his cronies. Notice in verse 21, no specific location is mentioned. They just came back to Israel. Undoubtedly coming from the direction of, of Egypt. They probably came up through the south and they would have they would have come to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And perhaps in their own thinking, that would have been the place to stay. And after all, they knew the child was Emmanuel, God with us. They knew he was to be the Savior, Jesus, for he shall save his people, was his name. They knew he was the Messiah of God, the long-awaited, the promised Holy One of Israel. They knew this because God's angels had told them. And they probably thought Jerusalem was the place, or maybe Bethlehem, where he was born in proximity since he is the king, we better stick around. But that changed very fast. Look in verses 22 and 23. We'll see that the family finds Nazareth. Family finds Nazareth. 22, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. When Herod died, the kingdom was spread around. A man named Herod Antipas took over the, the Galilee area up in the north. Herod Archelaus took over the Judea area. Now, both of those, incidentally, were Herod's sons who obviously were not murdered. He evidently didn't think that these two were threats to take over his position, so he let them live. And now they are taking it over. But notice, probably he put something in there as a provision that their territory was split up. They wouldn't have as much power as he would. They'd be half the ruler than he was. So they were more like governors or territory, territorial princes. Antipas ruled in the northern area. Archelaus was in charge in the south. When Joseph heard that Archelaus was in Judea, he was afraid to settle there. Because while Herod was still alive, Archelaus had gained his reputation. Herod had decided that he wanted to take a huge gold eagle. Listen. A huge gold eagle, which was a symbol that the Romans liked, and placed it over the gate of the Jewish temple, which was, you can imagine, poorly received by the Jewish people. Because to the Jews, it was an abomination. They considered it a violation of Exodus 20, verse 4, the commandment about having other gods. The Romans equated the eagle with Zeus and Jupiter, meaning a symbol of the two false gods, was placed over their temple. There were two famous Jewish teachers at the time by the name of Judas and Matthias. Now, don't confuse these with other biblical characters with those same names. These are very common names in that, that point in time. These two experts in the law of God got their students together and they said, are you going to let that guy put up that eagle in there in the temple? So they got the students all riled up, which is fairly easy to do. 
And then the students climbed the temple roof and they started to tear that eagle to pieces with their axes. Now, predictably, they were arrested and they were brought to Herod. In order to avoid a wholesale insurrection, he sent them to Jericho for their trial. Now, they received a mild punishment. The students who actually did the destruction were given a mild punishment. Their two teachers were executed. Herod died, and at the following Passover, a rebellion broke out in Jerusalem because of the execution of those two teachers. This is just before the time when Jesus comes back from Egypt. This tremendous rebellion happened because of the murder of these two great teachers. Archelaus, who is now in control, quelled the revolution by slaughtering 3,000 Jews. He just lined them up and slaughtered them. Many of them were pilgrims who were attending Passover. Herod Archelaus quickly grew his reputation as being more hideous than even his dad. The Romans who tolerated all manner of tastelessness even removed him. That tells you something about him right there. Almost 30 years later, he would be replaced by a man who we know quite well as Pontius Pilate. All that was to explain why Joseph had second thoughts about going to Judea. And his thoughts were confirmed because he was warned of God. Now, here's the fourth element in these prophecies surrounding his birth to show that he was born a king. He was to go back to Nazareth. And according to Luke 2, verse 4, Joseph and Mary were from Nazareth. They were to return to live out the prediction of the prophets who said he would be a Nazarene. Now Matthew says the prophets said this. It just never got written in the Old Testament and it was finally recorded here by Matthew. There are plenty of things that were said very significantly that that weren't necessarily written down in the Old Testament. For example, here's a quote. Jude, verse 14. We went through this a couple years ago. It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. Now, Enoch didn't say that in the Old Testament. It's not there. We know he said it because Jude said that he said it, and Jude was inspired by the Holy Spirit when he wrote it. That's all we need. Matthew just says, the prophets said, he shall be called a Nazarene, which tells me that it must have been common knowledge that the people knew the, what the prophets had said about the Messiah. In this particular chapter, we see the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem, his family's exodus into Egypt, the ravaging at Ramah, and the stigma of the name of Nazareth. John 1.46 Nathaniel said to him, remember Jesus is getting ready to call Philip and Nathaniel. And they're talking about it. Nathaniel said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? <clears throat> Philip said to him, Come and see. In Acts 24, 5, we have found this man, they say, Paul, a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. And he is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So you can kind of get just off of a couple of verses here. It's, it's a term not of endearment whatsoever. It's a, it's a term of derision. It's like almost a, a, a four-letter word here. They, you notice, they don't call him the Bethlehemite. He was born there. They called him the Nazarene just to be ugly. You may have heard the name Jerome, 4th <clears throat> century Catholic priest who translated the Bible into Latin, into what we what is called the Vulgate reports the synagogue prayer in which the Christians are cursed 
as Nazarenes. They say, may they be blotted out of the book of life and not be written with the just, these Nazarenes. If Jesus had been raised in Bethlehem, if he'd been raised in Jerusalem, he would not have been despised in that same manner. God said he would be despised, and being from Nazareth just added to that. Nazareth would supply him with the name Jesus the Nazarene, which you and I sing today in hymns, and we sing it with pride, and we sing it with love. For those people, it was a negative title, and God predicted it would come. The Nazarene was despised. He was rejected. And he was ultimately murdered. Matthew paints a masterpiece of a picture when it comes to the details of the Savior. Micah said the king would come to Bethlehem, and he did. Hosea said the king would come through Egypt, and he did. Jeremiah said there would be weeping like Rachel and Ramah as their young mothers wept over their dead babies beside the tomb of Rachel in the, in the Ramah of Bethlehem. And there was. The prophets of old said his name would be Nazarene. And he would be from Nazareth. And he was. Notice that at each point that Matthew makes, Jesus fulfills a prophecy that solidifies his right to reign. He is king. By genealogy, by birth, by worship, by the jealousy of hatred, and by the fulfillment of prophecy, this man was born a king. For this cause, he came into this world. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we do again just praise you for how these details fall into place the way you said they would. We thank you for these hundreds of prophecies. We thank you for the fact that Jesus fulfills them all. We thank you for the fact that only Jesus fulfills them. And I pray, Father, now if there's anyone in our sanctuary here or anyone listening to this over the internet, I just pray, Lord, that if there's, if there's anyone here who has never trusted in, in you and, and made Jesus the king of their lives, I pray, Father, that, that now is the time that you will move through your Holy Spirit and that you will draw them to you in a saving way. This is our prayer, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark is here. It's going to lead us in a couple of verses of a hymn of invitation. If there's any business you need to do with the Lord, if you want to unite with this church, if you need to get right about something, if there's anything at all that you need to do, I'll be down front. So while Mark plays and he sings, we invite you to come.